Okay, okay. Now I can share my screen. Yeah. And uh, here we go. So let me see. Okay, I can close this. Can you see my screen now only? Good. So, um, yes. good. So, my name is Marco Russo. I'm here today to talk about uh, external tools for a Power BI desktop. So, the idea of this session is to explain what is this feature that I will explain you uh, from a user point of view at the beginning, but then we uh, try to understand how it works, how you can connect uh, many other tools, uh, and then I will spend time showing you three popular tools that uh, we have today, but uh, there are already many others, and probably there will be more in the future. We are actually working on some external tool for, uh, for uh, many Power BI users, I hope. But uh, today we will see only something that is already available. So we will uh, just uh, try to understand what you can do with this and also to understand uh, what could happen when you use an external tool. So in a way, you have to trust the tool because you allow that tool to access your data on your local computer. So be aware of that. Just a couple of uh, seconds about uh, what I do for a living. I work in SQL BI. We produce content uh, training uh, for uh, Power BI, especially data modeling and DAX uh, for Power BI, but also for analysis services. You can find a lot of content on our website, also tools, uh, a lot of free content. And of course, we also have some video that uh, we sell. Before looking, I have very few slides, just as a, as a recap. And uh, what I want to do what I want to do is to focus on uh, demos, and I will use mainly demos. So, so where we start? Since July 2020, Power BI introduced uh, a feature that is called external tools. So if I go here, you see that they have a menu here, which is showing uh, now three icons. You might not see these uh, uh, external tools uh, ribbon, if you don't have at least one tool installed on your machine. Now, these three tools have uh, set up uh, programs that when you install the latest version of the tool, these programs do something to say, wait, Power BI, hey, Power, hey, Power BI, I'm an external tool. You should show my icon in Power BI desktop. And uh, you can send, you can open any 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 program this way. So before looking at how this works, because this allows you to connect an external tool to Power BI if you want, let's see what you what we can do and why having external tools is useful. First of all, we have a single icon to open the tool within Power BI Desktop. So if I click on Duck Studio, for example, here, what happens? I open a tool, Duck Studio that is automatically connected to this instance of Power BI Desktop. So you see that uh, I see my window of Duck Studio, and if you use Duck Studio before, you should know that when you open Duck Studio, you see a dialog box that asks you where you want to connect. But in this case, I didn't have to do that. Why? Because uh, you see that uh, this string, localhost 61269, this is the string that enables Duck Studio to be connected to my local instance of uh, Power BI Desktop. And it was Power BI that uh, provided this information to Duck Studio. And so by doing this, uh, what can I do? I will show you a few of these tools. I will show you Duck Studio later. So let's start with another simpler tool, which is Analyze in Excel. And uh, for example, I use this tool often when I am developing a Power BI model. Because I'm developing a model, I'm creating DAX measures, and then I want to try the numbers that I produce in my report with a tool that allows me to easily check whether the numbers are correct, because maybe I want to check whether the total actually corresponds to the number that I expect, uh, and which tool is better than Excel. So if I click Analyze in Excel, what happens? I open Excel, but this Excel instance is connected to the Power BI desktop model. So you see here that, uh, even though I use a large phone, so I don't have to use the zoom too much, but you see that this is a pivot table 
that has the same measures. Let me open this. I have the same measure that are in Power BI Desktop. So if I include the number of customers, the number of lost customers, and then I include here, for example, uh, the calendar year, and I see these numbers in the pivot table this way. Now, this data is the same data that I have in Power BI Desktop. But if I change, uh, and for example, let's do something strange, right? I go here and I say, okay, customer, the measure customer is this number multiplied by 10. So I'm modifying the model, I'm modifying uh, the database that I have in my local Power BI Desktop. You see that all the numbers now have been multiplied by 10. If I go back to Excel and I just refresh this, you see that the numbers have been updated in Excel too. And as I said, I use this because maybe that uh, I want to do something like uh, average uh, of uh, this. Sorry, average of, uh, come on. Let me go. I want to do the average for a range of cell. That is something very easy to do in Excel. I cannot do this in, in Power BI. And this is the real reason I want to use Analyze in Excel. Now, the nature of Power BI Desktop is that every time you close Power BI Desktop and you open the same file in Power BI Desktop again, the string we used to do this connection changes. The number that you see, have seen after local loss changes. And this means that if now I save my Excel file, my pivot table in Excel, and I open the Excel file later, I will certainly see the numbers that I saved last time. But if I try to refresh the pivot table, the refresh will fail because the connection is no longer valid. So the idea is that my external tool, my analyze in Excel, is just a way to automate something that I was able to do before by finding the right number to connect to Power BI Desktop, but it doesn't change the nature of the connection, which is not available if Power BI Desktop is open, and uh, I didn't close Power BI Desktop since I, when I started the connection. So this is uh, not something new, and uh, we have plans, by the way. So what, what I'm using now is a tool that I will show you where you can download, and I will show is an open source tool. We, are, we have plans. I, I actually developed this tool, and we have plans to introduce new features, like uh, actually retrieving a specific Excel file for a specific Power BI Desktop file instead of opening every time uh, an empty pivot table. So there are a few plans we have, but these are plans for the specific tool. Now I want to start uh, saying, okay, why this work? Why this works? How does it work? Can I create my icon for my own tool? So let's see how this works. The feature external tools technically works this way. We have, and uh, let me go back to the slides one second. We have in this folder, Microsoft shared Power BI desktop external tools in uh, the program files, common files directory. But the, the initial directory, this, this directory, program files, common files, could be different if you install Windows in a different uh, directory or if you have Windows in a different language that is not English. But the common program files is the, you know, name that identifies this special folder. Within this folder, you always have these uh, uh, this hierarchy of folders, Microsoft Share, Power BI Desktop, External Tools, which may not exist in your computer. If you never installed an external tool, you don't see this directory. You can just create this directory, or you can just install one of the external tools. Now, let's take a look at what we have. So if you remember, I have uh, three icons, which correspond to these three files. And you see that the files are dot PBI tool, dot PBI tool. If I use a different uh, extension, like in this case, I wrote uh, PBI tool disabled. This is not recognized as a valid, uh, valid name. So if I open this, uh, is that, this is actually a JSON file. What does it mean? The actually, sorry, I, I forgot. There is always a JSON final part. So the extension of the file is dot JSON. But the final part of the na file name before .json must be pbi tool. So .pbi tool .json has this meaning, 
you write anything else that does not end in pbi2.json, it is ignored, like my fourth file in the same directory, in the same folder. Now, let's take a look at the, the file analyzing excel.pbi2.json. I didn't create this, fan, this file manually. This file has been created when I installed analyzing Excel. But if you create this file manually, you create a JSON file that has uh, this uh, curly brace. Then you have name analyzing Excel or whatever name you want. And then you have uh, a path that describes uh, the executable that you want to run or the PowerShell file that you want to run, for example. You are saying, I want to invoke this executable. I want to run a process that uh, is stored here, but that this process is started using particular arguments, which is this other element of the JSON file. Now, this is a string that can include a few special names that are replaced by Power BI when you run this. So if you write percentage server percentage, so this means give me the server name, which is localhost column, uh, sorry, semicolon, and then the number, oh, column, sorry, colon, and then the number. This is a Power BI Desktop that automatically replaces this. And what is this data? Now, we didn't do this, but actually, when you create a Power BI Desktop file, there is an internal database name, which is a strange number, a strange string with a lot of numbers and letters, is a global unique identifier. And again, you, you cannot guess this name. Having this name for free from uh, Power BI Desktop is very useful. These two arguments allow the program, in this case uh, Excel, to create a connection to connect with the database that has the data for your Power BI Desktop. And you can use any tool that has a valid uh, connection to analysis services, because technically Power BI Desktop hosts a local instance of analysis server, analysis services, sorry. And, uh, the way we connect to analysis services is through these two arguments. Um, Marco, I uh, we can't hear you. Uh, sorry, I think somebody muted you. Could you please unmute yourself? Oh, let me try. Can sorry. you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yes. sorry. Okay, so uh, I was saying the, sorry, I was describing this, I was, I was describing that the icon data is uh, the description of the icon you want in Power BI Desktop. So Power BI Desktop does not automatically show the icon of the program. It shows whatever image you put here. So imagine that you want to create, uh, for example, uh, some shortcut to start uh, a particular application that is not even connecting to Power BI. You can just create another file in that special folder. You can decide what is the image you want to display here, and you can extend uh, this ribbon with as many icons you want. Okay, so this is the technology behind. Power BI Desktop just uh, lists these files. Uh, for each file, it creates an icon that uh, can execute an external program, providing to this program the information to establish a local connection to the local Power BI Desktop file. Okay. Questions so far? Do we have questions? Um, okay. Shane um, raised a question. He raised. No, I just raised my hand because I couldn't hear Mark. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, great. Sorry. Okay, so uh, this is the technical explanation. If you uh, want more information about this, I think that there is a blog post from uh, Microsoft. So if we search here, 
uh, Microsoft uh, Power BI external tools uh, blog. Here we have the same information that I provided you. Program files, uh, not here. No, so it's in the documentation. So there is another link. This one. No, this is uh, the other. Oh, I forgot. I, I was uh, I tried this before and it was the first. Uh, I probably made a, a different search. It was in docsmicrosoft.com. So let's say it's site, blog site uh, microsoft.com. And uh, here we have uh, this uh, detail. Yes. This is the documentation web page that explains uh, how to create the file if you want. So at the bottom here, there is an explanation of the arguments that you can put in the JSON file and where you have to put the JSON file. So if you want a real detailed description, I suggest you to uh, reference uh, this uh, documentation, the Microsoft documentation for that. So now that we understand how this works, we can spend time looking at the tools. And uh, let me go back to the slide. So the first tool we have seen is Analyzing Excel. Analyzing Excel is an open source tool. You can uh, download and install from sqlbi.com because uh, you can download the installer. And the installer is signed by SQL BI. So this way you don't have any strange warning when you install the program. However, if you want to look at the source code and you want to contribute to the source code, you can search for this tool on GitHub. So if I go here, GitHub SQLBI.com, GitHub SQLBI, you, say, you see here Analyzing Excel is the project where we have all the, you know, all the sources. This, this is written in C Sharp if you're interested to contribute, or we can just take a look at how it has been written. We have a roadmap, and now we are at version one. We are planning uh, version two and version three so that we, instead of opening an empty file with just a pivot table, we would like to open uh, a file. So if I am on a particular part of the desktop file, whenever I click that button, I would like to open uh, a more a pre predefined file. I just want to change the connection string so I can retrieve an existing uh, pivot table or chart in Excel with more, inf more calculations that I use in Excel. Usually I do this to validate my model. I don't think that this is a tool for the end user. I think this is a tool for the re report author to have another tool to work on the data and to validate the data. Okay, and so this is uh, analyzing Excel. I don't know if you have any questions about analyzing Excel, otherwise I will move forward. Do we have any questions? I don't see any in chat. Okay you haven't answered yet. Okay, don't, don't be afraid of asking questions. I can also come back later on this, so don't worry. So the next tool I want to discuss, I want to talk about is Dark Studio. Uh, I guess that many people already have seen Dark Studio. So I will try to give you a very, very quick overview about Dark Studio, but I will spend more time on what I think are those features that are useful, regardless of your knowledge about DAX, because uh, even though you just uh, started using uh, Power BI without having too much experience about DAX, so you don't create or you don't need to create complex DAX uh, expressions, you still can use DAX Studio for a couple of things that I want to show you now. So let's see how it works. So here I have a model, and if I click DAX Studio, what happens? I have another program that uh, allows me to run a query over DAX Studio. For example, if I know DAX, I know that if I write evaluate followed by the name of a table, for example, product, is like in SQL asking a select star from product. And I can see here in this results pane the content of the table. Actually, this is an editor of a DAX query that I can write and execute. Now, many people say, OK, I want to execute uh, sales amount. Sales amount is a measure I have in my model. I want to execute this. But if you try to run this, it doesn't work. You have to write a valid uh, DAX query. And sales amount is just a measure reference. What I can do to execute a query or any DAX expression is writing evaluate followed by curly braces. 
curly braces is a syntax that uh, defines a table that could have one or more rows and one or more columns. In this case, I'm creating a table that has one row, one column. I click run and I see the result here. I could write here sales amount comma uh, total cost. Uh, let me see if I find, I don't remember the, the measures I have. Oh, lost customers, for example. Let me reduce this a little bit and I click run. Now I have two lines. You see that, that this syntax uh, is row by row. Let's say that I want to see two columns in a row. You use uh, these brackets and now we have uh, one column, sorry, one row with two columns, value one, value two. You see that you don't have control over the name of the columns. It's just a way to quickly get uh, a sort of anonymous table with uh, names that are automatically created for you. And of course, I could uh, create uh, two rows, two columns each. Maybe just to have fun, this is divided by two and this is multiplied by 10. And I click run and now you see that I have two rows. Uh, this is divided by two, this is multiplied by 10 and so on. So I can continue this way, but it's just to show you the syntax we have here. Why should I use uh, DAX Studio if I don't know the syntax, if I don't even write DAX? Well, first of all, you could use a DAX Studio to check uh, how big your model is. If I click on this advanced view metrics, you have in this pane this uh, information about uh, where you are consuming the memory for your model. You see that in this particular case, my model, if I go to summary, my model is eight megabytes, but sometimes the model is much bigger. This is the size in memory. This is usually bigger than the size of the PBIX file. The PBX file is usually 50% of this, more or less. But uh, this is the cost in memory. And uh, I can see of this memory where I'm spending more memory for different tables and for different columns. So every column could have a different cost because of the compression. And sometimes you might discover that you are using uh, your memory for columns you never use. So the easiest way to optimize your model is remove those columns that are expensive and you don't need. This way you save memory, you reduce the file size of PBX, you reduce the time for refreshing the model. Uh, you don't actually improve the performance of the query, but you improve the performance of everything else. So it's a, it's a good tool to, to, to be used for these, uh, for these requirements. Now, another thing you can do, and I think this could be very useful if you go to if you start using uh, paginated reports. Now, paginated reports today are a feature, is a feature for uh, Power BI Premium. But uh, in reality, the tool for designing a report, a paginated report is free and it works locally for free. First, second, Microsoft announced uh, a few days ago that uh, in a couple of months, we will have a Power BI Premium per user. And this is going to be a game changer because uh, it will allow an organization that doesn't have premium capacity to just provide the premium feature to a few users, hopefully for a very small cost compared to the premium per capacity. And this way you can have all these features that now are available only for uh, uh, premium capacity. Which means that when you need to create a report that has many rows, with a lot of details and you could export this to a PDF or to an Excel file, instead of trying to obtain the export feature from Power BI, which is a total nightmare and it is not designed to do that well, it is much easier to design exactly the report that you want in multiple pages and obtain that through the paginated reports. Now, why I'm talking, what is the connection between DAX Studio and paginated reports? Well, paginated report starts from a DAX query that you can create within uh, um, the report builder, but you could also create and test uh, probably better in DAX Studio. DAX Studio has a small query builder now, which is this one. I can uh, drag and drop, for example, the city and the country and uh, the number of uh, new customers here. And I run this query and I see the result here. But I don't, I not only run the query, I can see the code for this query that is generated automatically for me. And I could include other filters. I, I could create a more complex uh, 
syntax. Now, one word of caution, we, the next release of DAX Studio will have a much better quality of the DAX code generated. We found a number of uh, anti-patterns in the code we generate now. But we have plans to improve this better. I mean, Darren is working on uh, improving this, adding uh, other features. And so we, we think that this will be an easy way to create and test your queries in a very quick way. The idea is that a paginated report can run a query over your data set published on parvia.com, get the result of this query, and show this result in a table or in a chart that, that, that you create uh, in a report that you export usually as a PDF or as an Excel file, even though it could be just a, it could just be a, a long list in HTML if you prefer. So <clears throat> this is the second feature, and of course we have also other features for DAX code optimization. But probably, if you already know these features, you already know DAX Studio. Otherwise, if you are new to to, to DAX. We have a number of features here to, that help you understanding the query plan and finding the bottlenecks of specific DAX uh, queries. But this will require a session by itself. So I'm not going to show you too much there. It's just another feature we have. But again, the idea is that why should I use DAX Studio? Because it helps me writing the DAX code, uh, testing the DAX code, or even just looking at the distribution of the data in my model, finding possible optimization, removing need and are expensive in memory. Other questions so far about Duck Studio or analyzing Excel? Um, yes, I've just yeah. got copied. Can you see chat? Uh, because these are a bit Long yes. questions. Okay, so let me see how can I open the chat window here. Yeah, I just posted there. The Take last one. From. Uh, two questions. One okay. is Could by an, mm -hmm. uh, analyzing Excel. Why didn't you calculate the origin probability directly? Thank you. Okay, I will. Uh, okay, let's start with this. Okay, this this is a good question. So. <clears throat> Okay, so let me explain. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking if I have a good example, probably not here, but uh, let me try to describe the problem we could uh, see here. So let me remove this multiply by 10. What do you see here? You see that I have, uh, let me see if I have this. Come on. I want just to remove the definition of the, oh, here we go. Okay. So think about this. In this report, we're looking at uh, these numbers. We have in a particular month, uh, for example, in April here. Sorry if I that does the computer is slowing down too much. But so, for example, in uh, in July here or in in May. In May we had 1,000 customers. In uh, May we had 774 customers. 479 were lost customer, 275 are returning customers. Now, if you think about the, I don't want to show you now the DAX code. This is complex. The, the, the DAX code for these three calculations could be complex. And imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment that we created the new customer, the lost customer, and the returning customers with three different algorithms. Now, what is the number of customers I have in a month? Is the sum must be the sum of new customers and returning customers. So if I want to validate the numbers I'm obtaining in this report, what should I do at this point? I should create another column that sums the new customers and the returning customers computing in this report and check whether the number is equal to the number of customers I have here, which is calculated with another technique. I know that in order to validate the correctness of my two measures, new customers and returning customers, I have to make sure that those two numbers are equal. Okay, this is the problem. Now, an easy way to do that could be, oh, Marco, what is the problem? You can do this. You can create a new measure, and you can uh, create this new measure with this formula. Let me write validate uh, report is equal to 
new customers plus um, returning customers. This one, okay? And to be honest, in this particular case, but only in this particular case, I know that the number will be correct. So if now I retrieve my measure here, you see that uh, the numbers I have in the last column are identical to the number I have in the first column. So I'm validating this correctly. But the reality is that uh, assuming that I made uh, the right thing, uh, it could be dangerous. Let me explain you why. First of all, I'm assuming that the formula I wrote here is summing the two numbers you see in this report, which is not true. I wrote another DAX expression that is potentially evaluated in a different filter context, which could produce a different number. No, remember, not in this specific case, but there are cases where I could see another number for a wrong reason, or I could see the right number, the number that I expect, but in reality is not the right number that is computed by summing the two numbers. So to make a long story short, if I want to be 100% sure that I'm summing the two numbers that the user sees and not the numbers that I could compute in DAX, I should uh, export this table and I should sum the two numbers manually or with Excel, but after an export. And uh, so this is the first reason. The second reason is, imagine you have uh, thousands of rows, literally thousands of rows, and the numbers are always the same. How can you make sure that the numbers are always the same? You should create another measure that computes the difference between the two columns, and then you should filter for this measure. But you are introducing new measures in your report that could affect the calculation and could create false positive or hide the good negative. So it's dangerous. What I'm saying is that if my real goal is to validate the DAX measure without creating another DAX measure that could have the same problem, I prefer to do this. I prefer to do this. I prefer to go in analyze in Excel. And I prefer to create uh, the same pivot table, not because I have the pivot table in Excel. The real, my real issue is that I want to use uh, the ability of Excel of summing columns. So imagine I have this, I have new customers, I have returning customers and I have customers. Then I have here in the rows, I include, let me include here the fiscal, uh, let me see, what can I use here? Uh, the fiscal year. And uh, let's see if I have something better. The month, the fiscal month, this one. Okay. So now if I create here in Excel, a simple formula that says equal to this number minus this, uh, sorry, equal to new customer, sorry. I don't want to do this with a pivot table. I want to do B4 plus C4 is this number. Then I could write this number minus, because in reality I want to see whether I have a different uh, total. Sorry, I have to, I don't want to write. I had to write to minus uh, D4. Okay. Now I'd use copy and paste here. Here we go. And now it's easy. Imagine you have thousands of rows. What you can do, you can copy and paste and sort by, and you can see, or you could write a feature in DAX, you could group, you can use all the features you have in Excel, which is faster. It's faster and it's safer because I am working on the result of a calculation and not uh, writing another DAX expression that could propagate the error in a different strange ways. Okay, so this is the reason why I wanted to use Excel to do this validation. And uh, let me go back to the question. There was, so this is the, the question about uh, analyzing Excel. The second question is about DAX Studio. So we came across a problem in DAX Studio. This software keeps asking for admin rights for running the software. Okay, so let me think. The problem is the following. So. Um, Mira, can you can you explain whether the problem is the setup or running the software? Because as far as I know, 
most of the features of DAX Studio don't require administrative permission. The administrative permission is required to do specific tasks or to install the software. So if you have to install the software, you have to be an administrator. And you have to be an administrator also to specify the values in this folder. So when I shown you this folder, I forgot to specify that these PBI tool files are stored in a folder that you cannot modify if you are not an administrator of your local PC. So the idea is that uh, this is uh, a protection in order to avoid it, that you can uh, get uh, any kind of junk uh, software. Imagine that you navigate on a website and the website tries to download something in this folder. This is not possible. You have to confirm the operation and you have to be an administrator. So Mira, do you have some more information about this? Uh um, hello, uh, Marco. So Hi. it was it it was all right. We installed, yep. But then I think probably what you were showing, uh, then when uh, somehow Dax was remembering that it's just was asking. I couldn't get uh, access to the software. It was asking for administrative rights to run the software, and maybe what you were showing basically the folders with the uh, with the location of the external tools or, or something we will try i will just uh, basically point out the it department but uh, it department came back saying that seems like this software will be able, you have to be an, uh, have uh, administrative rights to write to run the software i don't know whether it's correct or not and i just uh. To. So I don't think it's correct. So I uh, so just to, I, I think we can give an information to everyone. So if you have problems with uh, Duck Studio, the best way is going to GitHub. There is a fold. There is a page in GitHub for Duck Studio, and here in the Duck Studio repository, you can go here in issues, and you can write here what you found, and you can also look for. Uh, cases that has been closed already, finding whether there is something similar to what you are experienced. As far as I know, you can run DAX Studio without being an administrator. Of course, you cannot install DAX Studio if you are not an administrator. But these are two different things. Installing the tool is different than running the tool. So I think that if you clarify exactly what is the problem, you can write here, uh, Darren uh, or I, we, we, we will... Uh, check this and we will provide more details. Okay. Thank you. And I think sure. there was another interesting question that I'm interested as well to hear. Yep. So from Patrick. Yeah, we got one more from Patrick, yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, this one, okay. Yeah. Mark, I know you did a poll, blah, blah, blah. The impact of the open source is struggling community that they're safe and most of the standard. Okay, so that's a that's a good point. That's a good, very good point. Um, I don't have an answer about this, but uh, I think that the real problem is the productivity. One thing I, I you know, this is a, a small, how do you say? Um, I, I, I'm not prom promise. Uh, I, okay, I don't have to promise something, but we have an idea about uh, doing a demonstration of the cost of uh, not uh, adopting a more productive tool, and let me explain. At the end of the day, an open source tool is safer, potentially safer, than a closed source tool. Now, if the, if the decision is, I want to trust uh, Microsoft only, I don't trust anyone else, uh, okay, period, we cannot, we cannot uh, discuss, right? Because it means that you don't want to use any tool from an external vendor, period. It's not a problem of the open source. And, uh, but if the question is, should we use an open source tool or not in the company? Well, actually the open source tool, uh, because it's open, uh, enable a company to review the source code, which you cannot do with uh, a closed source tool. So to be honest, from a security standpoint, the open source software is much safer than anything else. Of course, you have to review the code and you have to validate that this, it is safe or not. And this has a cost, I understand that. But it also has a cost 
not using a tool for a principle. Because not using a tool for a principle means that if I have to execute a task that requires uh, three hours in Power BI and requires uh, 20 minutes in Tabular Editor, for example, to me, the cost for not using Tabular Editor is two hour and a half, which multiplied by the you know, wage of an employee and multiplied by the number of employees and multiplied by the number of times this task has to be done in a company is a number. This number justifies this uh, decision or not? That's the only question I care about. Because at the end of the day, the IT has one goal, run the company. If it, in, if it is increasing the cost for running a company, it is failing. That's my point of view. At a certain point, there is a threshold where this decision is too expensive. You just have to make a calculation. Did we, you know, did we go over this, this threshold or not? And from my point of view, the question is not if Microsoft should do something, because Microsoft will never do all the tools that you can imagine you can do, because Microsoft is a company that says, uh, is this tool uh, increasing the adoption of Power BI or not? Because Microsoft revenues only come from Power BI adoption. If you adopted Power BI, your productivity is not a problem. You have to think about this because uh, the pressure on Microsoft to make the tool more productive is lower and will be always lower than the pressure for getting new customers. This will not going to change and not just for Microsoft, for any, any other vendor. So the moment you have a marketplace, a number of users to which you can provide tools to be more productive. Yes, Microsoft is interested in making you more productive, but at a certain point, uh, there is a limit to the resources that they can uh, provide to that. But for your company, this limit could be different. And so it's just that from my point of view, we're talking about money. I know I'm not interested in a philosophical discussion about is it right, open source or not, or blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I, to be honest, I also think that if a company I can trust sell a closed source tool and it is improving my productivity, why not? So I'm just saying the open source tool is a way to provide you accessibility. And I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not saying that the open source is the only way. I'm just saying that uh, saying that the open source uh, is unsafe uh, is a statement that cannot be, cannot be considered correct. It, it is actually, it is the opposite. It is just that you don't want to spend time analyzing the tool. That, 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 that's a totally fair position. But the statement should be, we don't have uh, the resources to validate open source tool. Okay, that's a, that's a good position, but, but it depends. And then the result is the same, I understand this. But uh, at the end of the day, the question is about money, is about resources, is about priorities. That's the question. Putting the problem in from another perspective is just a waste of time. It's just a conversation, but it doesn't bring anything new to the table. Okay, sorry, I'm passionate about this. Okay, there so is one, uh, I think that's all for the questions, but I think there is a raised hand. Yes. Uh, I... um, Do you want Paul? to unmute yours? Yeah. Paul. Yeah, I've just uh, got a question yes. about uh, the tabular model editor. Yes. Is this uh, as powerful as um, using Visual Studio to develop okay. tabular models? Uh, I, I, I'm gonna okay. We can uh, we can move to the because it is actually my last uh, demo, and then uh, I try to keep. Give me five six minutes to talk about Tabular Editor, and then we will be you know we will focus only on on uh, open questions about the tool. So let me go back to. Uh, I also have seen a question about how to enable external tools. Uh, external tools are automatically enabled if you have. Uh, uh, these files uh, and you have the latest version of Power BI Desktop. Until the version of August, uh, the tool were disabled there. So you, you were able to see the icon, but you were not able to click the icon if you were opening a file that was not using the latest metadata version. So what is the trick? But now this is in production, so now it changed. Until one month ago, if you went to options and settings, and you went here in options, 
there was um, here in uh, what is per settings region? Well, oh, it is a beer. We no longer have the preview features here. Okay, here preview features. So in preview features, we had um, checkbox for new enhanced metadata format. This uh, choice disappeared with the September release because now this is the default. So now this is in production. So until August, you had to enable that uh, option and save the file with that option enabled to activate the access to the external tools. Now this is no longer required because now the, the new format is the default. And so now it should work. Now, here I have a model I created in Power BI Desktop. You see that there is another tool called Tabora Editor. What happens if I open this tool? I open this tool that you can download, Tabora Editor. And first of all, this uh, shows a warning because uh, Tabora Editor can actually modify the model that you have in Power BI Desktop. But Tabora Editor has been designed as a tool to edit an analysis services model. And remember, when you run Power BI Desktop, you are running analysis services in, internally to Power BI Desktop. But Power BI Desktop cannot use all the features of analysis services, which means that Tabora Editor potentially provides you access to properties you should not use because these properties could be not supported by Power BI Desktop. So this is the reason for this warning. This warning is saying, be careful because uh, you could have access to something that uh, you should not uh, change. So to make sure you don't make any damage, create a backup of your PBX file before doing this. This is the warning. So let's say, okay, I have the backup. What I see here is my model as a set of tables, relationships and shared expressions and translations. Now, if I look at the tables here, you see that I have all the tables of my model. Every table has a list of columns. Uh, sorry, I have to go back and forth. And uh, columns could be also measures. Now, if I click on the measure here, you see that when I go between one, two, three measures, the time required to switch moving from one measure to another is very short. And uh, one reason why we may want to use Tabular Editor for Power BI Desktop is because uh, changing uh, the statement here, multiply 10, multiply 10. Now, I don't know if you know what matters doing this in Power BI, but it takes more time. Every time you click on an icon, you have to open the window. When you validate this uh, measure, you wait. Uh, you cannot switch back and forth between measure. And more important, now I'm using a single screen. But when I have two screens, I can keep the measure open in one window with Tabora Editor, and I can see the report in another window, which is much easier. Now I can simulate this this way, but of course now we split the, the, the screen in two parts. But uh, let's see if I can show you this. Now if I, you see that these measures have been modified here. So when I make a change here, the change is still local to Tabular Editor. And you see this with this icon. If I save this uh, file, what I'm actually doing, I'm committing, I'm confirming these changes on Power BI. So when I click Save, these changes are applied here. And so you see that now the report is refreshing and now these numbers change. Now these numbers are small. Let me increase now this, you see that this is bigger. Now, the, the, the screen is small, but if I have uh, two monitors, it is way more productive. I don't have to hide my report with the editor of the DAX code. And just this is the reason for me to use a tabular editor. But of course, there is more. Because we have tabular editor, we have access to features that are not available in the user interface of Power BI. Like, for example, I can go here and I can create a new calculation group. Calculation groups today are available in Power BI Desktop only through an external editor. Which external editor? Today, Power BI Desktop, but Power BI Desktop, uh, sorry, today, Tabular Editor. 
But Tabora Editor is just one of the external tools that use a technique that is uh, supported by Microsoft. What is not supported is modifying properties that are not supported in Power BI Desktop. But Microsoft provided a list of those properties that you can change, and you can change measures and calculation groups and translations for uh, maybe translations are not supported yet, sorry. Perspective, perspectives are supported. So perspectives, measures, and calculation groups are three features that are supported by Microsoft from an external tool that uses the API, published API by Microsoft to manipulate that. So saying that the tool is not supported is at the same time true and false because Microsoft will never support all the external tools. But Microsoft supports the API, and we are using a tool that is using the API. So if you ask me, is a Power BI file that has calculation groups supported? The answer is yes. If you ask me, does Microsoft support the Tabular Editor? So can you call Microsoft if you have a problem with Tabular Editor? The answer is no, because it's not a Microsoft tool. And so Microsoft cannot support an external tool. But uh, if you do the right thing, in the in the model, it is if the model is valid, the, the model is supported. These changes are supported if you use the XMLA API by yourself. So so if you if you read the, the specification and you use the XMLA code by hand, it works and it's supported. It has to be. So Tabular Editor is a tool that has uh, many features that can uh, enable a sort of offline. Uh, uh, offline editing activity over my model. And because I committed the operation when I click save, this improves my productivity, my productivity, especially if you have a large number of tables and measures in your model. Because when you have a large number of measures, sometimes every change to every measure has to be validated across all the measures. It takes time. And so the experience of maintaining a large model can be very, very painful. And tabulator saves a lot of time. There's much else, but now I want to go back to your questions. So let me see if we have any other questions. So da, da, da. Uh, I pasted all in the bottom mark off for you. Preview feature. Okay, the, the preview feature that Kalina Ivanova mentioned, that sorry, that Albert mentioned to Kalina is a preview feature for August. Now, in set, if you install the latest version of uh, Power BI, the, the, the setting disappeared because now it's in production. Okay, okay, same thing. Which version of Duck Studio are you using? I can see the query editor used in the demo. Uh, just use the latest version. Uh, actually, I don't even, I'm not even running the latest version here. There is a new one, but there is a new one uh, that will be out in one, two weeks with a better quality of the DAX code generated by the uh, the query editor. If you install the latest one, 2.12, I think, uh, let me show you. 2.12, 2.12.0.1, 2.12.1, I think we had 2.12.1 or 2.12.2 now, I don't remember. Uh, I use the recording of <laughs> your question. Can I change the order of the appearance of icons in external? Oh, this is a good question. The order of the icons. Oh, this is a good question. I think we can try because I never tried this. But if I call this uh, ZZZ, okay, I have to open another instance of, of, of uh, Power BI because there are two options. One is that the, the name of the file provides the order. And the other is the name of the tool provides the order. So if it is the name of the file, it is it is uh, enough to hack uh, the file name. But of course, you have to do this every time you install a new update of Duck Studio. For example, if you want to move Duck Studio, because uh, every time you run the setup program, the setup program is going to replace the file. I never tried this, so it's the first time. So if, I, I don't know what happens. Let me see. And we have, here we go, here we go. So it's the name of the file. I, yeah, it's, it's the name of the file. So the alphabetical sort order of the files in this directory provides you the, the, um, the position. So one easy way to, do, to, to obtain the sort order that you want 
is that you could write uh, 01 and then 02 and then 03 because this name, the name of the file does not appear here because the, the name that you see here in the ribbon is the name that you have in the JSON file. This is just uh, the order in which they are they appear in the external tools. So this way it will be the first one. Now I restored the previous one. Okay, let me go back to the questions. Is there a PBA tools for yes? Analyze in Excel. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, maybe I didn't. There is a file analyze in Excel PBI tool here, which is a cor which corresponds to the Excel file you have seen. But I suggest I strongly suggest you because you cannot. Uh, you know, we need a specific executable to do that. And so, if you go to SQLBI.com/tools. You see here we have uh, analyzing Excel. You can download and install this. And when you install this file, you automatically get the JSON file in the proper folder. So you don't have to worry about this detail. I'm, I just mentioned this because if you want to make some experiment, you can. And let me see if I have any questions. With the latest September release. Uh, Okay, this is another convincing argument for using tabulator. Can we read laser dates to data variable? In fact, uh, can we limit slider dates to data variable? In fact, well, depends. It depends on how you create the calendar table. And uh, if you have a shared calendar table, you can create a slicer with a filter using a measure. So the answer is yes. You apply a filter using a measure. So I think we have some some article about it. I look at for the articles uh, about. I think we have. Let me check. I think I have a so CQBI filter slicer measure. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, this one. Uh, look at this article. I don't know why it goes to Facebook. What does it mean? Okay, I don't know why it found Facebook. It's strange. So this one, syncing syncing slicers in Power BI. Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, article, it explains uh, a way to avoid obtaining the behavior that is described in the question using the bidirectional filter. Don't do this. Don't do this. The way you obtain the same result is by creating a, a measure filter in your slicer. And look at the article, there are several examples for doing this. Excel chart, customization, Power BI Visual. Yes, you can use Excel. I mean, you can use Excel. If the, if the question is, can we see the Excel charts in a Power BI page? I don't think you have any hope to see this in your life, but you can uh, do something like you can create an Excel report that is connected to Power BI using Analyze in Excel on PowerBI.com. So you publish the model, use Analyze in Excel for a model that you published. Analyze in Excel in Power BI Desktop is just for development purposes. But when you publish the model in PowerBI.com, you have analyze in Excel there. You created the, ex the, um, the report in Excel, and Microsoft announced a few days ago that they will uh, improve the feature that uh, you have in Power BI. When you publish an Excel file in Power BI, you will be able to have a pivot table that is live with uh, the data set in, uh, published uh, with, uh, with, with Power BI. So in other words, the pivot table and the pivot chart that you have in Excel connected to a data set in Power BI should be working. Also, once you publish the Excel uh, report uh, on Power BI uh, soon, I don't know how much so. Microsoft said that they are working on it. Now, soon is a strange word for Microsoft, but it could be in a few months, right? I hope. Usually within six, nine months, but. So, excuse me, so it will be yes. via analyzing Excel. So that's what you're saying. So you that connection will be in analyzing Excel. And okay, I can so let, let, let me clarify this because maybe I, I didn't uh, explain this enough. So let me go to my Power BI uh, desktop uh, 
environment. No, sorry, not the Power BI.com environment. So here, if I go to my workspace, okay, and I open an example I have here for, let me see, uh, I don't know what I have here. I should have some example here, introduction to that, this one. I open this report. So this is a report I have uh, in uh, Power BI, dot com right here you have uh, where is somewhere here i have analyzed okay, here we go here i have analyzed in excel now this is the official analyzing excel for power bi but it works when you publish a data set on powerbi.com uh, if you remember i said i use analyzing excel in power bi desktop as a development tool because I don't want to wait for publishing my model and then connecting, it takes time. I don't have time. I want to work during the development. I'm writing DAX measures and I want to test DAX measures with Excel. When I want to do that, I use Analyzing Excel in Power BI Desktop. But Analyzing Excel in Power BI.com does this. It downloads an Excel file with a connection connected to Power BI.com, right? And now if I open this file, this file here, I will see in a moment. This file is connected to the cloud and is consuming data from the cloud. Now, I can create my report here. So, for example, I include here my, I don't know, let me see. Uh, come on. I have a fast laptop, but it's not enough for. Okay, here I have my model. Oh, I don't have any measure here, sorry. So, I have to do this. Oh, this is, this is a number. Because now I chose. Um, I chose a model that doesn't have any measure, and if I don't have any measure, there is nothing I can say. But imagine for a moment that I create a, a pivot table like the one that I created before, like this one. Now I have this pivot table connected to the dataset in Power BI.com, and now I publish, I save this model um, to Power BI. Now I cannot do this, but the, the goal for Microsoft is to create a live report in Excel published on the cloud that is connected and so this is live, I can do this. If you do this now and you publish this on SharePoint, for example, you cannot drill it down because uh, the connection doesn't work. You can just see the last version you saved of the Excel file, but you cannot navigate into the data because the connection is not live. And the idea is to bring the, the, connection, li the connection live for the reports that you, that you save this way on the cloud. So everything will work uh, in a browser. Okay, that's the goal, working in a browser with Excel. So is anyone using Tabular Editor to manage all the roles in their model? Mm, I don't know. But, I mean, technically it works. Uh, tabular Editor, there are many other things. Uh, questions. Uh, uh, okay. I think you answered most of the questions in that. Okay. Uh, okay. There are a few in the bottom. Okay, so let me see. Mark, is there a web page to know what is supported for modification? Uh, yes, the article I shown you before. The article, let's see if I found the article. So it was uh, Microsoft.com external tools Power BI. This page has the list of features that are supported. And uh, these are the three features that are supported. Measures, calculation groups, perspectives. There are more things that work, but these are supported. So if you have a problem with these three things, you can open a ticket and they, they have to fix it. Um, if you, for example, if you use translations, 80% of the things work, but it's not supported yet. So. That's uh, the situation. But this is the list, and uh, hopefully this will, this list will increase over time. Hopefully, it has to increase. Um, what kind of changes can we do elsewhere that we can do in Power BI Desktop? Uh, well, you cannot create perspectives. You cannot create calculation groups. These are the two features that you see here. These two features are not available. These two features are not available as editing features in Power BI Desktop. You can consume a model in Power BI Desktop, a model that uses perspectives and calculation groups. But uh, 
you don't have an editing, uh, you don't have an editor in Power BI Desktop for these two features. Whereas you can, of course, edit measures. It is just a question of productivity for the measures. The limitations uh, when connecting Power BI to analysis services in online mode. Uh, okay, so the question is, when I connect Power BI to analysis services tabular in live mode, uh, I can only create uh, local measures, and this is not going to change. External tools cannot do much because what you can what you can do with the external tool, you should be able to connect it to analysis services. But if you connect to analysis services, you're using a tabular editor like uh, SQL Server Data Tools, so you are modifying the model on analysis services. An important feature you will get uh, in a few months is a uh, um, new version of composite models where you will be able to connect it to external models. Okay, Microsoft already announced this. This is coming, even though later this year, we will be able to create a model that has a, a connection to other models. And so you could create a local model connecting to the external model, but you import additional tables and create additional measures in this super model. But I think that, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember if Microsoft announced that when they will release this, but it should be by the end of the year, at least in preview. And uh, I hope I didn't disclose anything that isn't NDA, but I, I hope I, this, this should be public, yes. Uh, okay. I think that's pretty much it is, Marco. Uh, there are okay. some raised hands. Yep. If you want to talk. Oh, so this is a, this is a uh, good yeah, question. Uh, Marco, sorry. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Marco, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, I, I haven't got the chat window, so I can't for some reason um, add anything to chat. So I've got a question. Um, when you um, right click in tabular editor on a measure on a table, you can view dependencies, which I think is an amazing feature. It means that you can actually see if a measure is used or if you, even a table is referenced. Do you know if there's the ability or if the ability is going to come so we can actually see whether a measure is actually used in the Power BI report? So if someone's created a measure, mm -hmm. but it's not actually been used in a visual, Sometimes we go through and we see measures and we think, well, why is that that you know is it actually being used anywhere? Okay, no, no, Do you know I, if I, am, I, I completely understand your question, and uh, unfortunately, the answer is uh, it requires at least thirty seconds. First, what you mentioned is the reason why I suggested to not rely too much on the features that uh, analyze the dependencies, because uh, if you analyze the dependencies within the file. This is good if you have uh, the model and the report in a single file, but as soon as you publish the model and you allow other people to create reports over the model, you, you, you don't have any control anymore. Now, imagine Microsoft uh, create this feature because only Microsoft can create this feature. Imagine Microsoft creates this feature and uh, scans all the reports you published in PowerBI.com looking for uh, dependencies in the existing reports. Okay, imagine for a moment that this feature exists because it doesn't exist now, but imagine they do this. Do you think it is enough? No, because it isn't, there, is, there are no ways, no ways you can analyze the dependencies for uh, local uh, reports. If you use Analyze in Excel or you connect Power BI Desktop to an external data set, you don't know what is going on. You receive queries, but you don't know anything else. So there are only two things that you could do. One, capture all the queries sent in the history to a specific data set, analyze all the queries and uh, detect whether each single column was used or not. If you never use the column, it is not used, but it, is, it will be very expensive. Or rely, and this is what I suggest, rely on conventions. If something is visible, you can use it. If something is visible, you have to assume that you have to support it. If something is visible and you're going to change it, you have to assume that you're going to break some report. Which means that don't make everything visible. When you import data and you say, oh, maybe I would use this, this column. Okay, not visible. When a user asks for that, visible. All the columns with the numbers, not visible. I show only measures. A measure, if I, publish, if I make a measure visible, it has to be supported. 
Because you really, you cannot, the larger the number of users, the smaller your knowledge about who is using what. So from my point of view, it's more productive to say, okay, I create a model, but the moment I don't just do experiment for myself, I make the model public. And for example, you know, you can uh, put labels now to the models. It, uh, you can say this data set is uh, promoted or is certified. Now for a promoted or for a certified model, my assumption is if something is visible, it must be supported. It cannot change. Which means that you have to think two or three times before making something visible if you, nobody asked you for that uh, kind of uh, column or, or measure, because then you have to support it. Now, if you expose measures, you can always apply changes to the model later, as long as you keep the existing measure still valid. And so you can create. And so this is also another reason why I suggest not to expose columns that you automatically sum, two reasons. One, it is not supported for calculation groups. So you have to you know, disable that feature. Second, if the model is shared with many people, you're, you're looking for trouble when you want to modify the model. So this is my suggestion. But uh, of course. Something that does the scan on the, on, the, on the cloud would be useful. I agree that having the feature working on PowerBI.com would be very useful. I agree. I agree. Yeah. In our instance, we don't actually publish the data sets. So nobody will actually be connecting to a live data set. It is just a report. So, but yeah, I can totally understand your point. Thank you. Yes. If you have only your report and you know them and you want to review what you're using, I think there is some unsupported tool that does this, that analyze the report and provides you the dependencies. I, I don't remember if the red, Reza Red tool that does this. I, I don't remember. My problem with this approach is that, again, I don't fully trust this because it's as a, but if you need to do this, I think if you look around, there is some, some tool that helps you doing this. Okay. Oh, there is another question here. When uh, will, when we will have the Tabra 8 or 3 zero. I know. <laughs> I cannot answer. Uh, actually, I don't know the answer, but the real problem is that I cannot uh, tell you why I cannot say when. So it's a complex problem. And, uh, but hopefully soon, but at this point soon, probably other few weeks. I don't know. I actually don't know. But I'm optimist. Uh, one day we will explain why we are. <laughs> we cannot. <laughs> Sorry. But it's coming. Um, it's coming. Yeah. Go ahead. We got one more question in the chat where um, they are. Uh, I'll try to read it. So, hi, we about to migrate to PBI from SAP Vivo. So, we have a tool. Do we have a tool to migrate the universe to Power BI? Sorry, from which tool? Uh, from SAP Business Objects no. to Power BI? No, right? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. Now, in general, I mean, no. Um, my, no. These tools usually don't work. So if someone says, oh, we have a tool to migrate, don't believe them. Don't believe them. Because uh, the 10% of things that they don't migrate uh, will cost uh, 10 times more than migrating everything. So be very careful. Be very careful. I mean, it's a problem. Not all the migration tools I have seen so far usually had. Not, I'm not just talking about Power BI. I'm just talking in general. But no. Yeah, probably in Power BI they probably create horrible DAX as well. So. It's not gonna work. Yeah. All right. I I'm not sure if I miss. I think there is one more raised hand from Mihai. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I wanted to add to the previous question about the tool that shows measures which are used in visuals. Uh, it's called Power BI Helper from uh, Radacad. Okay, okay, so I remember. Okay, Power BI Helper. Thank you very much. Power BI Helper is the tool I was mentioned that uh, <clears throat> can show you the measures uh, referenced in a report. Now, one problem of these tools, which is actually not a problem, but uh, these tools, uh, potentially, they're using uh, uh, direct access to the format 
of uh, the file of PBIX, which could change tomorrow. So you cannot rely too much, but as long as they work, they work. So you, you can use them today, of course. The problem is that if you create a system that is based on a feature of these tools, you have to be aware that this could change in the future and you need the tool to adapt to the new, to the new format to, to, to still have the feature available. But in this particular case, it's not a problem, I, I agree. I, I'm thinking to other systems that someone created, the, uh, creating tools that every day modify the PBX file externally. They work, but remember, if you go to the format of PBX and you inject uh, visuals in a page, uh, this could stop working tomorrow, okay? So you are, especially if you are creating a tool that is in production, you are you're taking a risk, right? Because it could stop working any day. But, but for a tool like uh, dependencies, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, that is a. Uh... Okay. Oh no! I, oh wow! Yeah. We, uh, the... <laughs> We're getting more. I, I see there are there are a lot of uh, things uh, discussions <laughs> going on, so I cannot read everything. Um, yeah, but there are two questions at the, all yeah. the way to the bottom. Yes. Oh, okay. So, can I use tabular editor to create columns and measures in bulk? So, in general, yes. Tabular editor has the ability to create scripts. And you can create scripts to automate pretty much everything. The scripts can be written in C Sharp. You can find in the tabular editor documentation a lot of examples for that. And uh, I think there is also a GitHub uh, repository with a lot of scripts as examples. So if you look around, uh, you go to the Tabular Editor website, you will find many things. And uh, the problem is for Power BI Desktop, you can safely create measures in bulk, but uh, you have to be careful in creating calculated columns because calculated columns are not supported. Technically, probably they work, but I think that they are not completely validated. So there could be something that doesn't work uh, well. So for the calculated columns, I would say I would be very careful. For the measures, of course, 100% it works. For, that, for, for, for analysis services, you have no problems. You can do whatever you want. Uh, if you have time, could you talk about tips, smart practice to name measures and column versus technical measures? Uh, Huh. It's hard. So what I suggest, if you have a measure that must be visible, use names that can be included in the report. So no short names, no prefixes like dim or factor or something like that. Uh, use the space between words uh, and so on. Whereas for internal measures, you could rely on some uh, naming convention that could be use uh, remove the spaces uh, for longer names uh, don't use the uppercase for the first word so like uh, use the camel case instead of the pascal case with the spaces for example or uh, use an underscore but the underscore is usually to see to me mm. i think that the important thing is being consistent so Identify what works for your company and your team, and then try to be consistent. One thing you can do with Tabular Editor, you can create a rule to validate that the names that you have follow the best practices. So there is a tool in Tabular Editor called Best Practices Analyzer, but each best practice can be programmed with a script. So basically you can have uh, rules that you customize. So you could define a rule and then you could create um, rule in Tabular Editor that validates your model if follows the rule that you define or not. And I think that the consistency is the very important thing. So define a rule that you like, but then be consistent. And you can enforce or you can validate the, the, whether the model followed the, the rules by just looking. If the measure is visible, it must follow these rules. The name must follow these rules. Otherwise, uh, it must follow others or something like that. This, this is something you can do. Okay. Uh, did you see other questions? Otherwise, I think. The, yeah, there are two more questions. Okay. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so there are one asking about what about XML endpoint for visuals. 
Um, that's pretty much it is. I'm not sure what exactly that means. What? And there is another question asking about, is there any external tool to do documentation automatically? Okay, so the first question is what? Uh, ah, XML endpoint. Okay, okay, now I understand. So first question, what about XML endpoint for the visual? The, the question is, can I have uh, an API to modify the visuals in a report? And the answer is no. No. Um, as I said, I know companies that opens the PBX file, modify modifying the JSON file of the part that describes the visuals, then save the PBX file and it works. But as I said, is a risky business because uh, one thing is doing this for the demo, but uh, going in production with this stuff uh, could be dangerous. As far as I know, it is not possible to do the same on the cloud. So connecting to Power BI and doing this, no, because the only API you have, you can upload a PBX file replacing the existing one. And so when you do that, you replace the entire PBX file, including the data set. So first of all, you should split the data set from the Power BI part, but then you have to upload a PBX file. As far as I know, this endpoint doesn't exist but not only that, I don't have seen any plan to provide this feature as an API. Maybe that they, one day they will do that, but uh, when I say I don't see, I haven't seen any plan for one, two years, forget it, at least. Maybe later, if someone raises the priority for this, I don't know. The other question is, is there an external tool to do documentation automatically? I think I have seen something but the problem is always what do you want to do with the documentation? That's a real problem. What do, what do you want to do with the documentation? Because the documentation is something that no, nobody will never use. Uh, I don't really understand. So if the problem is compliance of and producing some you know PDF that nobody will read, get any tool defined or create your own. Because at the end of the day, you can scan uh, the tabular editor model, you can create, you can export the model, you can apply a few transformations, and you can create a document with all the descriptions. Otherwise, the problem is that uh, if the information you have in the tabular model is enough to document your model, I don't understand exactly what you want to do. Because your information is already there. What's the point of having a different format? Who will use it? When? How? That's, that, these are my questions, because uh, it seems to me that uh, you want to produce documentation because someone in the company decided that you, we had to produce documentation in this form, but, but if nobody read that documentation and that documentation doesn't include any additional information, it doesn't, it, it is not very useful. Okay. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it is. Um, okay. Marco. Okay. Um, there are a few more, but like, I think we could, uh, we already overrun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. as long as if you, it's okay for you, but um, yeah, no, no, I have now. Now I have to go. Now I have to go because uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I they are calling me. So thank yeah. you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. For thank you, Marco. Thanks a lot for Thanks. your patience you. in answering all the questions. It was a great session. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank yes. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.